point I'll keep coming back to because one of the key components for the heritage sector is its ability to reach audiences who are not normally engaged. Uh, we have a number of, uh, please look on our, our website, there's a very, um, there's a very, now a very rich uh, evidence base of our work there. We're academics, but we also are practitioners. We're interested in, in getting results, basically. Um, there's a couple of books I'd draw to your attention. Uh, my own, which explores the psychology of climate change, why our brains are wired to ignore climate change. I'll draw a couple of the findings from that. Also, my colleagues, uh, Jamie Clark and Dr. Adam Corner at Climate Outreach have produced a, an academic book through Palgrave. Um, talking Climate, which really is, a, I have to say, a very good synthesis of the existing research on, on how to communicate climate change and how to deal with those psychological challenges. Well, our research tells us a few things. I think it's important to stress everything that I'm going to say in this first part is, is based on uh, good practical social research. You know, we always say uh, there's a science to climate change and there's a science to climate change communications. They're, they're both grounded in, in strong evidence. First of all, it's clear that communicating with people based around facts and figures and data don't work well. And actually what people tend to do is that they tend to select the facts and figures which support what they already felt at the beginning. A lot of climate change comes from an empirical science basis, particularly the earth sciences, uh, particularly um, atmospheric physics. That is not enough. Uh, we know that people cherry pick the information they support and well, quite frankly, they don't pay much attention. It's a very strong tendency within the, um, my, my own environmental movement, which I've worked in all my working life, to use the things that work for us. We're frightened by this, and that motivates us, but it doesn't work for everybody. This is an issue that people don't react to well when we do the scare tactics. Um, what people tend to do is create what we call psychological distancing. They actually put climate change far away. In particular, they make it something which is abstract and distant and in the future. So um, the large majority of people in any poll that you take around the world will say climate change is a major problem for the future. But they're far less willing to accept that it's something in the present. And for the heritage sector, they're not at all willing to accept it's something of the past, unless it's a denial strategy in which they're claiming, oh, climate change has always happened. You know, for example, that little polar bear there on an iceberg. So that's really, in a way, a symbol of both climate change and what's wrong with climate communications. Taking the symbol of climate change to be a different species a very long way away is exactly what's wrong. And really what we have to do, again, what I hope the heritage sector can do is to find ways of bringing it home to bear in terms of people's real concerns and values. Also, then to recognize that climate change exists in the form of social facts, not scientific facts, unless you are a highly qualified scientist and, and the vast majority of people are not. Um, the components of that highlighted on this slide is that, it, is that it is communicated as narratives which are shared between peers. In other words, people understanding is based very largely on what people in their social group think, and that these narratives are not based primarily on scientific evidence, but they're based on values and identity. This is who I am, this is what I care about, and this is why climate change is important, or indeed not important, to me and the people around me in my social group. So all climate communications has to start from this starting point. We are concerned with building narratives around values and identity. Climate change is, is therefore a challenging narrative. As I wrote in my book on the psychology, we respond very well to things which are here and now, have a violent threat, have an enemy who intends to cause us harm, which is why uh, under conditions of war or attack or terrorism, we respond very, very fast. People regard the timing of climate change as being in the future, something which happens somewhere else, something within the general category of environment, not the real life of their concerns, something for which they might have some responsibility, but it's half of them to identify what that is. It doesn't have an enemy who wants to cause harm, and therefore it actually fits quite badly into our, the way that we think about the world and the things which motivate us, and it's sort of uncertain. Now, actually, that's a challenging narrative. That's not the fact of it. The fact is it's here, it's now, it's already happening, it's, <laughs> it's highly relevant to us. There's a shared responsibility, but that's not to say that there isn't any, but it's extremely certain, actually. So the challenge for climate communications is how to overcome those barriers. And this is, again, where the heritage sector comes in. The heritage sector is in a position of saying it's here and it's now, it's in the future and in the past. 
And I'm going to talk quite a lot in the presentation about this potential for shaping the timing of the issue. It's here. It's relevant to you and the things you care about. That's to say your values, and heritage is very strongly tied in with people's values and identity. We all have a shared responsibility for dealing with it, just as we have a shared responsibility to care for our past and our heritage. And the, the, the impacts are very clear and they're happening to us. And indeed, they're happening to these precious, iconic, uh, historical artifacts we care so much about. And here, indeed, is, is the kind of solutions that maybe the heritage-based climate communications can help to overcome. So really, a lot of what we're trying to do with climate communications is, we would say, as communicators, to reframe it, to find ways of presenting it in ways which speak in different ways to different audiences. The particular audience I really want to um, draw your attention to, because it's really fundamental to this, which is people with, we would say, small c conservative values. They may very well vote conservative parties, but they might not. Um, people with conservative values are found across the political spectrum. They are very strongly represented amongst the membership of, of um, heritage organizations. We know from the demographics of uh, visitor data that this is a very large part of the people who visit historic attractions are people with uh, center right conservative values. Not exclusively, but this is an important part. We are specialists in this field. We have, for the past four or five years, we've been writing specialist reports on it. This is just half of them. I think we've got like eight or nine reports now again on our website. And the reason that this audience is so important is that they are disproportionately likely to be not concerned about climate change. You'll see on this graph that conservative voters, which remember only one part of people with small c conservative values, are more than twice as likely not to be concerned and half as likely to be very concerned as people on the left. So climate change along the line has become a left wing uh, issue and is seen as such, especially in the English speaking world, I mean, most markedly, of course, in uh, America or North America, I'd say also Australia too. So the challenge for us is how to find ways of reframing climate change, which open that up. And again, this is where the heritage sector is so important. It's potentially reaching new people in new ways and saying, no, this is about the things which we're concerned about. We've done a lot of work on what conservative values are, and you'll notice I mean, it's pretty titchy script, so you don't have, have to squint at your screen. But you'll notice, for example, down on the bottom level there, the yellow block, loyalty to the social group, patriotism, national identity, pride, um, support for social order, um, tradition, law, order, um, um, achievement. Um, these, these sense of communal identity values, this is what makes us proud of being whatever, British or whoever we are, this is what's important to us, this is what we love. These are all values that are found across the political spectrum, but particularly in this centre-right space, which again is why uh, heritage sector is so important. Speaking, speaking with this audience, we would say in climate outreach, but this is the primary audience to speak to. People on the progressive left get climate change as an issue to a large degree. People on the right do not. So that's the primary audience that we have to win over. And you'll see there a list of some of the values there which come through. National identity and pride, of course, being key to uh, the heritage sector. But the heritage sector also regarded as an honest and authentic communicator. There's a lot of potential for doing work there. I'll come back to these themes as we go through. What does not work? Well, a lot of these things here. Um, go boom and boom. Um, eco language, so, you know. First takeaway for anybody listening to this call, please don't call anything that you're doing eco, eco this, or green castles, or, or um, you know, whatever language you might bring in. Because immediately people start saying, that's not me, that's something else. Doom and disaster, sorry, it doesn't work. And destabilizing schism narratives, that's something slightly different. That's like saying everything that we love, everything that we care for, it's going to collapse, it's going to fall apart. People don't buy it. This is a slow, creeping, or actually quite fast moving, but nonetheless relatively slow, inexorable process. It doesn't fit with people's sense of violent change. And this is an audience who doesn't like that. Social justice is a, a divisive um, conversation to be handled carefully. Um, and any language, global and distancing, talking about places that are far away or somewhere else. Um, well, 
people better distance climate change. So that's a huge problem for somewhere else. An interesting example of a national trust where we did some consultancy of a national trust uh, two years ago. Um, and this is a wonderful piece of communications they produced. They're talking about the environment, but it's not the environment. They're talking about fresh air. They're also talking to people's sense that children should be able to run free um, in, in the fresh air. Uh, my experience of, with people of conservative values is they have a, a, a strong sense of, of disquiet about the way that children, uh, the way that childhood is going, and that speaking to this sense of open air, free ranging, um, active, uh, exploratory childhood speaks very well. Fresh air is speaking very well to this audience. This is a, a program we helped design. Um, for the UK Climate Coalition, which is all of the groups working on climate change, including development groups and, and aid groups, including some trades unions, uh, churches, all kinds of interesting groups in the Climate Coalition. And the program is called For the Love Of. And what happens here is that people um, say, I love old fat trees and I'm concerned about what climate change might do. Or, you know, I love football or I love parrots or, although not on the screen, it could be I love stately homes, I love the old landscape, I love the Lake District, I love uh, castles, whatever. And this again was designed by us and has been very, very successful because it speaks to shared values which also work very well with a centre-right audience. It's not about saving the planet, saving polar bears or social justice, it's about the things we really love and care about and that, that works well. Again, these are kind of like messages which can work well in your own communication and heritage. We know that when we're speaking with the more centre-right audience, again, framing in communications, framing is a, the sense of using specific, very specific language which holds, which has a very, holds a very strong cluster of values. Um, framing around words beginning with RE of this sense restore, renew, repair, rebuild, because it holds on to this idea of putting things straight. Basically, a, a, core, um, a core narrative for uh, this centre-right audience is things have been disrupted, we need to put them straight. And that means, again, a very key finding for the heritage sector. These are all words which appear very strongly within heritage and conservation. And a very important way of, of speaking about climate change, climate change is a sign that the world is out of balance. We need to take action in order to put things straight to the way that they should be. We do a lot of qualitative research and people talk a lot about how things should be. And this is making things as they should be. <laughs> not every reword, of course, not revolution. Um, so, I mean, for example, practical piece of work we did with a large scale renovation um, campaign. Um, as an offshoot of the, of the European renovation industry, they, they have a campaign called Renovate Europe, talking about uh, targets of reducing energy consumption in um, existing building stock uh, by 80% by 2050. That's their target. And we advised them on how they could speak better to centre-right parliamentarians. And we said, lead on respect for the past. Renovation equals renewal. So talk about how this is something we do out of our love and our respect for our heritage. And therefore updating it, insulating it, making it more efficient is a way that we preserve and enhance it. We don't damage things, we rebuild them, we renew them. And let's face it, if we're gonna be serious about climate change, renewing or rebuilding our built environment is critical. Obviously, there's going to be some aspects which are which, which we, we can't and shouldn't mess with. But um, here in Britain, I'm speaking to you, we have the oldest building stock in the world. <laughs> and so, you know, dealing with climate change seriously means a lot of old and some historic buildings are going to have to be handled carefully, but preserved, enhanced and renewed. For example, is a language which worked very well. We tested this. We love our heritage and old buildings. They create a link with our past. Now it's time to prepare the heritage for the future. So it's basically a language around protection and conservation. 
but responding to climate change is a way of respecting and renewing our built environments and our built heritage. Renovation is renewal. Again, we know with a large evidence base on this, but this is language which works very well with these audiences. But before I go to the, the final part, which is some examples and ideas, here's a couple of slides seeing it from two points of view. The first point of view is what climate change can bring to the work of people involved with engagement around heritage, organizations, communicators, um, who are concerned in, with this very, very broad field of, of, of heritage. I wanted to start with this because so far everything I've been saying has been about what you can do for those of us working on climate change. I want to say you will, and maybe it's a question we'll have, you could very well be facing obstruction within your organizations of people are saying, oh, this climate change stuff, we don't want to do that. A lot of people don't like it. Um, I don't see how it fits in. You probably have an internal conversation going on about the needs and opportunities for doing this. So let's look at some of these things. Well, first off, of course, obviously, is there's actually the energy, the energy um, consumption within any building stock you have, especially if you're dealing with heritage in the form of uh, buildings, whether those are buildings for museums or display, or whether actually the building itself is part of the of the heritage. Um, well, that's a very powerful means of public engagement as well, talking about how you've improved performance or you've gone over to a different heating system. I think finding a, finding a match between new heating technologies and old buildings is great. Um, often uh, there can be heating systems that are actually more sympathetic to old buildings in terms of their conservation needs. You know, low, low heat, low sustained heat systems. Um, um, we know, uh, and again, there's many examples here in Britain of uh, large heritage properties, for example, which have gone over to using uh, biofuels like wood, which is grown on the estate around them. And again, this is a, a very interesting message that you can talk to people about. So we're talking about renewables without necessarily thinking, oh, someone's talking to me about green stuff. Um, I think you have to recognize it's a major threat too. Like, I, um, this is where our work for the National Trust came in. This is, this is gonna really damage. Um, the, uh, the things we care about, and we need to be ready for it in lots of ways. Um, not just direct climate impacts, but increased temperatures will mean, uh, will mean that there will be increased threats from, um, you know, from fungus, from moths, from all of the things which lead to decay of, of structure and decay of, um, of artifacts. Um, telling new stories in new ways. Now, I, I'm just going to give you some ideas, but um, just to say, I think the really exciting and interesting thing for, for, for the sector, and if I was to imagine myself being a curator, is thinking that this is a way to tell a new story in a new way, maybe to a new audience. You know, we, 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 we struggle with a lot of the heritage sector, but it can often be very white, older. Um, this is a way maybe of reaching out to young people who are far more engaged and interested in climate change than older people. Um, we also know from the surveys that, that people from ethnic minorities um, are more concerned and more engaged often. So this is a way to speak in a different way, which might get people's interest. It's a way also to break out of the box. And I think creative things happen when you start talking across sectors. Um, new interpretations and new things I'll touch on this. Like ways that maybe um, talking about climate change might redefine what heritage is and what we should even be talking about. Some of the same things appear when I start saying how heritage can help us with this overwhelming challenge, which is how do we engage populations across the board with this overarching issue. Some of these things are the same. I think changing the relationship with time is powerful. Making climate change something which is really relevant to them, what they're proud of, what they care about, this thing of reaching new conservative audiences. And I think these, these category limitations of saying that this is an environmental issue or this is a scientific issue are very limiting for the way we think about climate change. Climate change is actually an everything issue. It's a gender issue, it's a fairness issue, it's an economic issue, it's a heritage issue. So the more that it's appearing in lots of different contexts and different ways, I think the more creative our engagement with it will be. So some of those things open up. This is a report uh, I recommend you read if you haven't already, Forecast Changeable. We contributed to this uh, and we gave advice to the National Trust when they produced it. And there, for example, is that the, the focus of that was particularly on 
examples of how climate change was a threat to the conservation of heritage. So that's one of the narratives. So for example, as I was saying, it's not just uh, flooding damage, it's um, how collections can have new kinds of threats from uh, insects, um, fungal infestations and so on. Um, actually, the, the, the photographs which really struck me, I have to say, was this little underwater. Um, you know, people regard going to see um, kind of historic locations often as a day trip. And uh, I think that's actually, I think the picnic table is probably a very, <laughs> very powerful image for that. Um, so yes, so the sense that there's damage, flooding is the most powerful one here in Britain. Uh, it's the most salient one because it really does damage things quite seriously. And I think that the communication is therefore communicating that, talking about that, including in the action what happened. Walden Pond is interesting. I have to admit I, I haven't visited, but I understand from uh, my, my friends and colleagues in the States that um, climate change has been incorporated in very interesting ways into the way that Walden Pond is, is presented. Uh, Thoreau is you know, one of the key figures in the building the American understanding of the relationship with its own environment. Walden Pond is in, forgive me if I'm wrong, I think it's in Massachusetts. Um, and Thoreau went out there and meticulously measured the changes of the seasons. He's a wonderful scientist of measuring what happened and then writing in a very powerful and lyrical way about it. This is a book which has been written on showing how his meticulous measurements have changed over time. It's a very powerful and iconic site for um, Americans and especially for New England. And what's interesting is that talking through the lens of this iconic attraction is a way of engaging people in thinking about the climate changes which are happening. This is another interesting example. This is, uh, this is where major uh, where major winds pulled down trees in one of the National Trust properties in Britain. This is a report from the Daily Mail. Um, anyone who's uh, not British will, will not know, but the Daily Mail is a very centre-right kind of newspaper. And look at the language on the left-hand side. Isn't it interesting? This is based on this is based on value and venerate these old sentinels. So it's this language about how this is embedded in our sense of who we are, our pride, our national identity. And they were brought down 150 years of this is the worst, these are the worst winds that come through Devon in 150 years. So it's a way of communicating extreme weather events, which is drawing people's attention to the sense of how unusual and powerful the event was and how we might be losing something, talking in a new and fresh way. That brings me on to this very interesting question of, of um, the relationship with history. As I said, one, one of the challenges for climate change is that people have a very strong tendency to put it in the future. Uh, here in Britain, in polls, 80% of people say that climate change will be primarily a threat for future generations. Well, it's, it's happening now, it's well underway, it's going to affect most people, certainly people like myself in middle age, is going to be severely affecting us within our own lifetimes. I think heritage has the opportunity of really helping to creatively rethink where we place climate change. Yes, in the future, we need to be looking forward, but because the, the heritage sector has such a strong and complex relationship with the past, it's worth pointing out that this has been going on for quite a while now, certainly um, Anthropo anthropogenic climate change has been well underway for 50 years, but there's a lot of research that suggests that actually goes back 100, maybe 200 years or more even. Um, so how it's presented within that timeline is a really interesting opportunity. Moving between history, challenges of present conservation, moving forward in the future. One way of doing that is that um, Heritage sites, especially older ones, contain within them a record of past, his, of past weather. It's way of making things very visual. This, I think, is from, um, this I recall is from uh, an old bridge in York, which had uh, extreme uh, weather. Um, it's a way of showing that what is happening now in terms of extreme weather is way higher than anything experienced before. And if you're dealing with a, a heritage location with a very long history, something which has a history going back hundreds of years, is making a very, very powerful point that this is unprecedented. 
This is, this is off the scale serious, as indeed many weather events are and will be. We know that, we know that in the end, in the end, we will only be dealing with things which are beyond the historical record. Another example, I think this again is a, an interesting way of weaving heritage with a climate <coughs> story. The uh, meteorological station at the, uh, held within the Radcliffe Observatory, which is a, an 18th century observatory in Oxford, has the longest continuous weather record in, in Oxford. And that's a whole, and in Britain, sorry, and that's a whole story. And then they had flooding three years ago that was the worst in, the worst in the 150 years they've been running. So there's a way that within this historical package we can make a point that these floods were exceptionally high whilst telling a very interesting story. Wow, isn't that amazing? 150 years people have been recording the weather and this is the worst ever. There are there some risks with this which you also need to be alert to? One is that talking about what I'm calling here heritage time, this kind of drawn out sense of time could lead people to underestimate the speed of climate change. Dealing with things which have been around for, you know, dealing with, say, uh, old properties or old gardens, landscapes, which have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, reduces our sense of the speed of change. And so in a way, the challenge is how within the context of something which seems to be slow moving in time, we can draw people's attention to the fact that this is urgent and moving very fast. It also makes a sense that, I mean, it creates the sense that people might think, well, you know, this has been around a long time. It survived all kinds of ups and downs and wars and who knows what. Everything will be fine in the future. You know, they create a sense of continuity, which might actually, again, reduce people's awareness of quite how serious this is. Also, if we show people severe weather impacts in the past, it might lead them to think that climate change is just merely an expression of extreme weather and that natural cycles are always with us, which is, of course, completely true. It's just that the current ones are getting increasingly more severe and warmer and warmer. So there's, there's a dangerous, I'd say that there's a dangerous, not dangerous, but there's a difficult psychological space to navigate here that you need to be aware of when you're talking about it. There's this, I, there's no such word as heritage, heritageization. I just made it up. But there's a way that past weather could become regarded as part of his heritage story. Like, wow, you know, in the, well, it used to be really, really cold in the past. This is a picture of one of the famous frost fairs on the, on the River Thames. Um, so, okay, so then it was very cold. Now it's warmer. So what? You know, change happens, things move on. Um, and it's important that people understand that these were both the, 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 uh, the, the, weather, the weather when I was born and the frost fairs are both still within the bounds of what was normal weather variation. And now we're outside those bounds. Again, it's this danger that heritage, the association of heritage might not show people that we've broken those bands. More pointing than I will not. Um, one thing I think which is very interesting is that it opens up all kinds of potential for incorporating new topics within the broader range of heritage. The history of climate science, the history of meteorology, these sciences which have led to this just as I was giving that example of Oxford uh, Radcliffe Observatory. The history of fossil fuels regarded not just as, uh, say, um, um, industrial archaeology, but actually as a movement from the fossil fuel age to the non-fossil fuel age, giving it that extra context. Cars, we're on the edge now of an extraordinary transition in cars. It looks very likely that um, within a single generation we will be shifting from um, uh, internal combustion cars to electric. Um, that means that cars, which were really part of heritage, um, will be regarded as something really fascinating and historic, or certainly petrol-driven cars. And renewables and solar energy, there's a whole history to that. I mean, I mean buildings designed to capture uh, solar energy for passive, for passive solar have been around actually for hundreds of years. And there's a whole story to be told about that. Um, already, many past renewables are already presented in interesting historical shape. So, to be honest, very rarely within the context of how these were the early, um, the early, early evolutionary ancestors of modern technologies, which I think is how they should be presented. 
the water wheels are the are the early predecessors of modern hydro. Um, you know these uh, these lovely old windmills are the predecessors of modern windmills. In other words, how heritage can challenge the idea of the past being a separate place and put us on a put us on a spectrum of showing the developments of things. It's a wonderful story. <laughs> Again, it's the National Trust being, I think, very creative. Cragside, built by Norman Shaw, uh, was built for um, um, Lord Armstrong, a uh, manufacturer of, um, oh, forgive me if I'm getting details wrong, but of uh, armaments. Cragside is a very large and interesting building in its own right, but it also had the first domestic electricity in Britain generated from uh, water, from microhydro on the grounds of Cragside. And the presentation now of the curation of Cragside has done both, put that within the context of saying, wow, this is fascinating the way that this place sits within the history of electricity, but also putting in a new, uh, you can see there on the right hand side, a new hydro scheme, micro hydro scheme to generate power to the site. In other words, creating this link between the historic importance of this building and new technologies in a very interesting and engaging way. I think, this is a, I think this is a fascinating um, example of what we've done. And of course, all kinds of other things, like the coal industry is already industrial heritage here in Britain. But maybe coal-fired power plants should be too. Maybe the oil industry too. Maybe at some point, you know, maybe, um, you know, maybe petrol stations will be things which will be visited this place. I mean, there's immense potential, and I'd really encourage you to think creatively about how the shift from climate change and into renewables will create new opportunities for new kinds of um, heritage exploration. I mean, we did a large piece of work here in Wales, so we are sitting in mid Wales now, for the Welsh Government on how to communicate sustainable development and climate change. We tested this across the country now. Wales was for uh, a long time in the, in the middle of the 19th century the largest exporter of coal in the world. Um, absolutely the backbone of the Industrial Revolution. And therefore, running climate change narratives saying coal is dirty, filthy coal, let's get rid of it, um, it's destroying the world, really speaks against that sense of national pride in that historic, um, that historic background. We found that actually we needed to talk about this in a new way. In other words, going back to that point about time, that natural resources built our country in the Industrial Revolution, that's the heritage component, and we are rich in the natural resources that will meet the new challenges of climate change that's moving forward. So again, that point again about how can heritage be placed in a, um, in a spectrum. There we go. And here's, here's taken from all of this. I might leave this on the, um, on the screen for a while. Just some of the words and the language and the frames that we know that, that we know might work well with heritage audiences. Okay, I will pass back over. So, I guess that could be coming back to me, George. Um, I'm just wondering what kind of questions that people might have and whether they want to put those in the chat box in the bottom here. Um, Sarah Sutton has um, shared the information that the Carnegie Museum of Natural History is hiring a curator of the Anthropocene. And I'm wondering whether you have any views on that. Yeah, I think this is, again, is an example of how um, the, the Anthropocene is a, this is, this is a very, this is a very interesting um, way of reframing something it's really a, I mean I understand also it brings in a whole new way of on a whole new way of thinking about it as well but it's a way of bringing uh, the impacts we're making now into something which has a much longer a much longer time scale and I think that's yeah I think that's exactly the kind of initiative I'm talking about the, the only problem I've got with the idea of that kind of framing is that I think it can be quite fatalistic um, and in some ways it implies that we all have the same experience of climate change, whereas we know that the poor are disproportionately affected, and it becomes this grand universalizing narrative that leaves us feeling that we have very little control about how we might affect this kind of almost predetermined space, this new geological epoch that we find ourselves in. I mean, does it make us passive, perhaps? I think that is a danger. As we said, there's a strong there's a strong tendency for people to 
um, distance themselves, um, and anthropocene and narratives could very well be within that category of um, of kind of extremist schism. You remember I was saying there might be dangers there with this kind of schism language. Um, or, or indeed, or indeed, you know, we're, I mean, again, we're navigating a, a difficult psychological landscape here because, it, as I'm saying, there are some things which intuitively we go, yes, that's a threat we need to do something about. But it seems that climate change, we have a very strong capacity to put up very deliberate psychologically constructed obstacles of going, I mean, I mean to, to accepting it, of just saying, well, the anthropocene, that just goes to show that things have always changed. Here's another thing that's changing. Yeah, I think um, that's, that's really yeah. right. And a lot of people are picking up on this idea yeah. that they don't like this idea of emphasising that the weather has always changed. They find that quite counterproductive because it lets us all off the hook politically, you know, which is part of a kind of cyclical sequence of events. Well, I'll tell you something about the, the Anthropocene um, and indeed a lot of climate communications, and this is a real danger, is that they are derived and built on the <coughs> values of the people who prepare them. So um, those people are often very sincere and very committed. They are they are disproportionately likely to be of a of a certain educated class, uh, certainly of a certain politics, and therefore what they tend to do is they tend to project the way that they see it and the way that it works for them onto things which go out to a much wider audience, which might include people who are not like them. And this happens again and again and again. It's been, in a way, the curse of climate change, because it's so driven by these values and identity-based narratives. So the big question I would say for Anthropocene or for any communications is, OK, you like it. Do you actually know that this really works in the way that you think it works with your intended audience? And can you test that in some way before you invest a huge amount of money in it? You know. Um, yeah, I, I did read one of um, climate outreach's reports on how visual images affect the public, the kind of images that work. And I think this idea that you're talking about, you know, working from love rather than fear is really resonating with people. Uh, Mark here is commenting on um, how concerns about preserving heritage is how climate change, extreme weather erosion, etc., uh, threatens loved properties and landscapes. So this suggests to me that maybe yeah. looking at kind of local environmental damage is quite an effective way to communicate with people and that heritage organisations could be doing that at their actual physical sites. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think it really brings on this opportunity of talking about climate change as, uh, as something which is here. And the point, I guess, which makes heritage so interesting is this sense that for, for many people it makes a very, very deep connection to their sense of who they are. So it's something precious. You know, we come, we go, we're only, you know, we're only on Earth for a short time. The sense that we contribute to a greater, um, well, what researchers sometimes call an immortality project, so a sense that there's something greater beyond ourselves. And that when we leave, we have protected what's come before and we've added and built on it. Mm. Um, is, is a very, very powerful motivator for people. The sense that something precious which has been passed down through the years is, um, uh, is, is going to be damaged. Yeah. You know, um, and yeah. I've certainly come across the argument that the heritage sector could be re re energized by the whole climate change <coughs> challenge because yeah. it's kind of discovering a new sense of purpose. And um, I'm just trying to reflect. Yeah, do we have some more questions or anything? Yeah, sorry, there's questions here. Um, mm. Someone is pointing out, Douglas, I think, that of course people working in the sector are working with limited resources yeah. and people are visiting sites as part of a leisure activity. Mm. So how might this limit? what professionals can actually achieve with the mainstream public who visit them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean so it's obviously it's a, it's a question which challenges all of us. Um, I mean, I mean, well, one thing to say on this is that because it's working beyond, because it's working between sectors, there may be a possibility that doing something around climate change opens up the possibility of funding from a source which otherwise might not be accessible. Um, you know, there are funds which are available for, for example, for science communication, which are not normally accessed by heritage organisations. Um, but the fact is that uh, the fact is that there is actually far less resources in public engagements around climate change than there is public engagements around heritage. So it's not as if there's some fat honeypot that we can all go to. Um, I think probably, I think probably the reality is to think of this as being one of those 
meta-narratives, one of those wide cross-cutting issues that there might be an opportunity to try and work into interpretation materials and thinking creatively, but also proactively, not reactively, proactively about is there a way that we can work this into something which we're going to do anyway. Just as, for example, you know, uh, modern curation now thinks in a much more progressive way about how might gender differences be reflected here, or uh, <coughs> historic properties very often speak in a very interesting way about the difference between, um, you know, the, the, you know the, the lord of the manor and the servants and the different lives they led. So in a way, class attitudes and gender attitudes and some race, race interpretations come in. So I mean, it's just another level of interpretation. Um, I'm going to throw you a sort of quite a different question, Please, George, but yeah. someone's saying, I have a question that students sometimes ask me, how can we explain uh, that the climate is changing when it was so much warmer 1,300, sorry, 130,000 years ago? Um, so, I mean, what would you recommend as a kind of independent, reliable source of students to make well, their own research? Well, I mean, the first thing, I mean, I mean, there are always, people always have figures about how it was warmer at different times. Um, if we take that 130,000 year figure, um, we were, we were, we were barely, we were barely on the edge of being homo, homo sapiens sapiens at that point. I mean, you know, we're actually very, I mean, the modern, modern humans, the point where we emerge from Africa and we, we, we start to, we start to really migrate across the world is, is surprisingly recent. So I think it's fair to say, it's always fair to say actually that means that it's, if that is the case, but it's hotter than it has been at any time in modern human, modern human development. But also, you know, these arguments, these arguments that say, well, what's the point because it was always such and such in the past, they're always, they're never really about a serious challenge to climate change. They usually want to be psychological obstructions to say, no, I'm not going to take this on board. I mean, in terms of what you say to your students, well, you could argue the science with them, if you want, and you could argue it much better than I do. I'm not a, I'm not a professional scientist and you could really get some figures. But I'd be a little bit more inclined to go to the meta-narrative, as it were, and just say, you know what, every scientific institution in the world says that this is a major threat. Every government in the world, <laughs> apart from a few notable presidents, think that it, this is a major threat. This stuff is changing. Or indeed, as I said in this presentation, there's a lot more to this story than just climate change. You know, the shift out of fossil fuels and into, and into non-fossil Fuel, renewable, sustainable, natural fuels is in itself a huge story that can be treated on its own. You can tell that story as well. Yeah, well, there's a tendency, I think, for environmentalists to kind of assume that their audience or think like us and to use the kind of arguments that aren't particularly effective. But someone has actually asked whether you, you have any information on demographics for kind of more conservative groups or people who are working hard on sustainability issues. I mean, have, have you had kind of contact with conservative with the small C groups um, who are interested in the kind of work that you do or reached out to you, George? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we work, uh, I mean, we, we've been working the whole way through our sort of specialist work with the centre-right with organisations and networks that work on that and there's, and there's uh, think tanks, uh, there's centre-right think tanks who work on this um, and uh, there's an entire conservative environmental network for example and there's other networks which have an interest in it. We did some work with um, um, this, is, this, is, this is where my, my, my brain tells me to say, um, with Rotary Club um, and Rotary Club isn't a, like doesn't have a label like this is a conservative network, but it is undoubtedly a conservative network. It's a, a centre right, and actually very much an interesting audience of people who are um, who are very largely male, white, middle-aged, successful, more conservative-leaning men. Um, and we did a, a very interesting program with them a few years back of doing a, of where they invited us to go and train people up to go and talk within uh, within Rotary clubs using language which spoke to them and their identity. I guess that's the point, is like, you know, people, every different audience needs to find language which speaks to its own values and its own identity, which is distinct to that. So, so within the heritage community, we need to find ways of talking that. And I'm not, I'm not denying there's an enormous breadth in that. I'm just assuming this conservative thing, but of course that's quite false. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of ways of talking about our, our heritage. Um, right across the political spectrum, um, um, but also, um, yeah. 
Uh, sorry, yeah. just um, yeah, quite a few questions here. There's some yeah. asking very big, broad questions about the role of heritage and the fact that we're facing, I suppose, potentially the, the end of human life. <laughs> but then, uh, by contrast, then you've got these emails, these sorry messages, getting into, into the particulars about, you know, there are heritage organisations who want to preserve the the appearance, the old historic buildings, mm. or, and they may be clashing then with people who have got more radical ideas about climate adaptation. Um, who may not be sensitive at all to how to actually preserve the actual character of individual buildings. Yeah, yeah. Um, could you say anything about that? Is that something that you've encountered, you know, kind of resistance to this idea of climate adaptation? Yeah. How can we do climate adaptation and be sensitive to heritage? I, I think, well, I mean, I have to be wary on this, but I, I'm, if I'm a specialist on anything that's communication, um, not, not heritage. Um, so, but you know, what I'd say is I think this is a this is a very important and relevant debate. It's an important one. Um, my own building is a listed building. It's 200 years old. It's Grade Two listed. So I've had personal experience of a struggle that I've had with the local um, with the lo local listed building authorities about how extremely difficult they make it for you to make any changes on it. For example, putting solar panels on the roof or making any changes. Which, is, which, of course, in, in, in heritage terms is absurd because my building has had changes done on it continuously over the, last, over the last 200 years, and now somehow it has to stop dead. So I think in a way this issue about how we adapt to this fits into what I'm sure is a much, much larger debate within the heritage community about the degree to which modern things can absorb and reflect continued change or the extent to which they get set in time or that it's regarded as, as a certain period that they represent. And I, I know that this is a debate which comes up every time you want to put on a, a visitor sensor or something, or what style is it, or you know, any time you want to you do anything with the building. Um, and my, you know, my personal view is that it's appropriate for historic buildings to sensitively respond to the times in ways which are interesting. Yeah, but it's, it's that one person here saying that it's actually the conservation officers and the local right. council, the planning yeah, officers, which right. creates a hurdle for people who actually want to make their own um, buildings, right. offices, homes more uh, environmentally responsible. That's right, and it, and it goes back to the, the thing I said right at the beginning, which is that every way we talk about this has to talk about it in terms of the values and attitudes and concerns of a target audience, and that goes for conservation officers as well. I mean, the starting point would be trying to find what are, the, what are the key things for them and how to reflect that. Now, sometimes those judgments are primarily aesthetic. So often we find that people's resistance to change is around the sense that things might look different. Um, we, did a, we did a bunch of testing for language about a low carbon future, which one of the key findings we had on that was that people's responses were largely aesthetic for different domains. So people are quite prepared to see major change in cities, but they regard cities as already being areas of major change. People, however, were very reluctant to see changes happening in the countryside, which they regarded as being part of their shared national heritage, um, and then, which is why in Britain, but not, again, I know we've got people from lots of countries here, but in Britain uh, there's been a lot of resistance, for example, to wind farms. There's this sense that it is damaging and undermining something where we have strong aesthetic attachments to a certain kind of landscape value. And again, this raises the question, well, if that is the core value and the core concern, can we do things which produce the changes which we think are necessary in order to primarily protect that property, say, or, or that landscape without having a, a major aesthetic impact? Um, I personally, I, I mean, this is a very personal thing, but I mean, I, I'm in favour of radical interventions where actually something new looks new, <laughs> you know, and you have, you know, you have solar panels on the top of Windsor Castle, and it's like, well, that's, that's. Yeah, I mean, there's a, sorry, there's yeah. a kind of misunderstanding, isn't there, that heritage is always about keeping things the same, but yeah. actually heritage has always been about managing yeah. change. And to change tack a bit, there's one very interesting comment about, obviously, we all care about the environment, we want to do what we can as individuals and organisations, and yet we talk about humans and we talk about buildings, but what if we drop the kind of eco side language completely, if you don't acknowledge the sixth mass extinction, mm. are we in a sense in denial? Are we perpetuating this idea that things are actually quite better than they really are, and is it all a bit too human-centric? Um, it's 
it's always a challenge on climate communications about the extent to which you tell people quite how damn serious it is. Um, and that's what can I say? I mean, it's it's not. I, the, I guess I guess what makes this challenging, but we could say, is it challenging or is it just uh, something that encourages us to be creative? Let's let's put the positive spin on it. Is that this is not easy. We're navigating some interesting, um, you know, as I said, psychological and social landscape with this, and there is an, it, always an interesting debate to be had about, well, do do you really hit people over the head with how serious this is and how, and indeed, the point about, you know, we being too human centered. I mean, we are we are not just on the edge of climate change. We're on the edge of a very connected issue, which is a massive extinction, which is already, wow. You could argue whether it's on the way or whether it's we're just on the edge of it. It looks pretty looks pretty serious to me. You know, to what extent do we talk about that? How far can we go with talking about a sense of loss without moving people into a sense of grief or sense of denial or refusing to face up to it? And a lot of this comes down to some very deep feelings about loss. That's why, again, I guess early on in the piece, I'm stressing that idea of repair, rebuild, restore. We know that psychologically people are very, very, are much more prepared to accept the idea of restoring past loss than they are averting future loss. So, I mean, that's a kind of, that's a sort of psychological experiment that's been run many times. So, narratives which are about saying something which is lost, we're going to put straight are very appealing to people, which is one of the reasons why, for example, rewilding is something which has had a lot of attention. Um, recently, there's been a lot of conversation about whether the links should be reintroduced to Britain, for example. And that's something a lot of people get very interested and excited about, not, <laughs> not sheep farmers so much, but um, uh, is, is the idea of putting something which was lost. Yeah. But is it, do you think it's a romantic idea? like overly romantic idea, the idea of rewilding. It's something that we can, we, cho we choose that narrative because it's more joyous. And that's what sort of our souls need it. Yeah. Well, it's joyous, but it's also, a, but I think also in some ways it's related to climate change, even if it's not explicit. It's a way that we are losing things, so what we're going to try and do is compensate by putting things right. It comes back to that restore and repair idea. Okay. And the idea that we can do things, the idea that we can, we can put right some old wrongs in the process of dealing with some future wrongs. And so that, I'll draw your attention yeah. to an, a comment from Mark who's yeah. saying, you know, what's wrong with actually accepting loss and change in the sense that's yeah. actually what's happening. And, and people are drawing attention to the work of geographer Katie De Silvi, mm. who's written on, you know, anticipatory history, the idea of palliative curation, of letting go. I mean, to what extent do we need to engage with this kind of idea that we do need to let go, we need to accept, and we actually we should grieve, that's human and natural, yeah. and then there yeah. are several stages of grief, and you have to find a, lost, uh, a lasting connection to the lost object. Um, so I, I'd have two things to say on that. I think the first thing to say is that this is anticipatory loss. And, and I think that that's a problem. Like, we have lost things in the past, but that's nothing compared to what we're going to lose over the next 50 years. And I think that part of the problem with climate change, because of the delay in the system, is that you are asking people to imagine in anticipation of a loss, which may or may not happen as a result of their actions now. It's far too much. This is not what people engage with well. Um, but I... But I, but I mean, I guess the, the point I make, which is a bigger one, is that these are all fascinating things to engage with. I don't know the answers. I, I want to be very clear with this. I'm not saying this is how you should talk about it. This is how people in the, what can we say, the heritage community should talk about it. I'm trying to point out that there's lots of interesting opportunities here. And I wouldn't want to lay down rules. I'd be inclined to say, look, if you think that you can take if you can take um, members of a public or visitors, whatever your audience is, through a journey which helps them to come to terms with and understand a sense of loss through what the heritage experience, fantastic. Make it happen. What concerns me is that actually the, 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 the world of heritage engagement as a whole is actually not engaging with this bigger issue enough. I know that there are some work going on, but also a danger that as we get further and further into major climate disruption, is we're moving the other way as a kind of, um, as a kind of sort of historic denialism, which I think is very, very possible. I think as things become crazier in the outside world, people will become even more invested in a past, in a kind of a, 
even a, even a kind of a fabricated past as a kind of as a place to find solace, and that will become then a self fulfilling a self fulfilling process. So that the right way of talking about this will be in terms of you know something which is secure and comfortable in the past. And I want it to be very much engaged with these current debates. Well, w one of the tips I had in one of your own reports uh, on um, visualising climate change was that if we use compelling and affecting images of members of the public, we then have to juxtapose that with some kind of ideas about how they could act positively and constructively in their own lives, mm. so we don't leave people feeling completely bereft yes. and hopeless. Yes. I don't know how realistic that is for, say, you know, an exhibition in a museum or. No. No, and I think it, it might feel. It, it, I mean, again, with all of these things, it's the, the uh, you know, as we might say, the kind of proof is in the pudding. I mean, if it if it if it works, it works, and some of this requires some experimentation. And earlier on, I was suggesting, you know, how do you know this works? It's probably a very good idea if there's any way that you can test your messaging or what you might be saying prior to investing major resources in it, just to mm -hmm. see how it works, it's because. Exactly. It's a it's a tricky thing to work through. You know, if you if you say this is something really appalling and serious, oh, and by the way, turn your lights off. Um, there's a disconnection there that doesn't help anybody. People just go, well, that doesn't sound so serious, or that's just stupid. I mean, we've been here. We've been here with climate change. You know, for a uh, large part of the period between uh, the first ten years of this century, um, the communication was around here are ten easy things you can do in your own life, and uh, it didn't work. It was not an effective engagement, which is why we always need to be finding new creative ways of doing it. Yeah, I think there's a nice comment here from Sarah Sesson saying, uh, I love that reminder that the future isn't actually fixed, it's still something that we can choose. It comes from a series of decisions that we still, we can still make these decisions. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of retaining the sense of, of hope. Uh, these yeah. comments keep disappearing off the screen, but someone else was just in a really yeah good comment about how museums need to use more feedback loops. Yes. But we tend to perhaps think that our job as communicators is that it's a one-way thing, we communicate to the public and that's it. Yes. So we don't test enough how those messages are being received and we don't have enough dialogue. Do you have any comments on that about communication yeah. and engagement as a two-way process and actually measuring, as you said, measuring how effective your strategy is? Yeah, well, the, 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 the buzzword of climate science at the moment is iterative process. So that, that applies, for example, to climate policy as well. We don't know for certain what is going to produce the necessary outcomes because there are so many variables, not just climate change, but all of the strange economic, social, political variables which make you know, human life so complex, especially in the short run. So you have an iterative process. You go, you try something, you see if it's working or not working, you reshape it, you move forward, and that idea of feedback. And I think that applies for public engagement generally, not just climate change, but I think also for climate change. Um, like how finding, you know, finding ways that, yes, indeed, but you, you test ahead of time, then you get the feed. Then you, then you get the feedback from that. Then you test as people do it. And if there's one thing that you know, climate climate outreach, we've been going now for 13 years. And there's one thing that we found from the very first year, and ever since we found started up, is never assume anything. You know, we have an evidence base which gives us the basis for making predictions about how we think people will respond. But actually, there's never any substitution to finding out and asking it because the way that people take what you offer them and reinterpret it and they see it through the lens of their own values, but also the lens of their own desire sometimes not to face up to this, um, or to reshape it in a way which is different. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to actually wind up, um, yeah. George, you've, you've yeah. spoken so well and thank you so much. I think the very good thing that's coming across for me here is that there's, you know, there's a lot of you out there writing absolutely fantastic comments and observations, questions, there really is a growing international community of people working in heritage who do want to be useful um, and who do, who do believe that we can actually make a change. That's been extremely gratifying for me to see today. And just to say thank you so much to everybody who has contributed so generously with their time and their expertise today and that we'll try and keep in touch all of us and see whether we can build on some of this and share resources and strategies. And if I can, the one thing I'd add to that is that um, as an organization, we would be very interested in talking with any of you that would like to take these, um, these ideas forward in the form of actual practical experiments, trying different kinds of language, testing it out, seeing what works or what doesn't work, and 
our specialism is we're not a we're not a like a marketing company. Our specialism is actually in going out there and trying out different language, and as we've been saying all along, trying out different approaches, testing it, not just language, also visuals, all kinds of approach. So if anybody's interested in trying something out, we'd be very interested in talking with you. So we'll do we'll some follow-on emails and and connections. Yes. Um, yeah, this conversation has been recorded. Um, and we will be sharing it with people who would really want to be here today but couldn't be. We have loads of emails from people asking us to send the links to this webinar. Um, and so we'll be in touch with the follow on actions and ideas. Uh, just, yeah, thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Bye bye.